to the next of our series of mini lectures on how a laser works. Uh, today we put a lot of things together from the past three or four mini lectures and that we've looked at in class and we see how the process of optical amplification works. Uh, there's going to be a lot of manipulation of differential equations and I'm going to skip over a lot of the steps because you can read about it in your book and if you want to take the time to derive it and hopefully I'll be able to focus more on the idea of what's happening rather than the math. Um, so let's get started. Um, we're going to give a so of more complicated view of a laser here to get started and remind you of things than we have in the past. Uh, back in chapter two we studied cavity stability and we could put, let me go ahead and grab a pen, we could, could, could put little dots on here based on the G1 and G2 parameters of our laser. In chapter three we studied beam propagation and came up with a set of equations for waste radius and the radius of curvature of, of beams on how the beams propagated. In chapter five we saw how the radius of curvature of the mirrors uh, because the, the beam has to make a round trip contributed to a particular Gaussian beam formalism. In chapter 6 we saw that the reflectivity of the mirrors when they're very high leads to only certain longitudinal modes or particular frequencies being allowed to bounce back and forth in here and that the, the field pattern has to repeat itself after a round trip. Now we're learning about this blue box inside the laser which is the gain medium. Our gain medium consists of a, a lot of atoms, and we treat them as a large ensemble of atoms, uh, millions or billions or trillions of them at a time. They have energy levels. Um, and really what we're looking at is how photons drop between energy levels 2 and energy level 1. And I've drawn a second energy or a third energy level down here, level 0. We're not going to discuss today, but that's going to be coming up in the future. Um, Really what these energy levels do, if we talk about transitions between N1 and N2, is they give rise to a line shape, uh, which is this curve right here that's discussed in Chapter 7. And this is the range of photon energies or frequencies that are allowed by the material and the distribution of the energies of the different atoms. And this line shape interacts with one of the longitudinal modes to give very sharp spiky things, so our laser operates at one frequency, but we'll get into that in the future. And the way we describe the interaction of the electrons and the photons is through Einstein's equations. And we have three processes. Spontaneous emission, where we happen to have an electron in state two, the upper energy state that drops down to state one, and the photon comes flying off in some random direction. Uh, this doesn't happen with interaction with a photon. It's just the electrons up there, it falls down, and a photon comes out. We have absorption, where you put in two photons, and one of the photons gives up its energy to raise the electron from the lower level up to the upper level and is destroyed. And we have a simultaneous, an, uh, an opposite process where you put in a few photons and the photons stimulate the electron to fall from the upper level down to the lower level and generate a photon that's perfectly in phase and at the same frequency and in the same direction as the photon that stimulated it. And the absorption and stimulated emission we saw can give rise to differential equations. Uh, and the differential equations we derived in the last mini lecture were how the number of electrons in state two changes a function of time and had spontaneous emission terms, absorption terms, and stimulated emission terms. Um, actually, this is stimulated emission, and this is absorption, and this one's spontaneous. Um, and then by making a substitution, simply converting this photon energy density into an intensity, we can rewrite the equation this way, which is the basic differential equation describing how in a two-level system electrons move around as a function of time. Um, <clears throat> and this sigma term is called the cross-section, and this cross-section, at least when the wavelength range is small, is in fact proportional to the line shapes. The line shape essentially determines the cross-section of the laser or how strongly it will interact with pho photons. Um, and of course the line shape is, is a function of the distribution of probabilities or number of states of the atoms that make up the, the gain medium. But if you look at these differential equations and for the, the, you know, to a first approximation, ignore all my scribbles here, what you're going to see is that we've got something missing. We have accounting, if you will, or keeping track of the number of electrons per unit volume um, or the number of atoms that are in state two and state one is a function of time, 
but we have nothing in here keeping track of the photons. So we need to keep track of another differential equation besides these, which is the rate of change of the number of photons, because we do have photons coming in and going out of the system, so it's not a closed system. In order to fully describe it, we have to keep track of both where the electrons are in our ensemble of atoms and the photons coming in and out. And that's where things start to get a little bit difficult, and we have to put on our green eye shades and pretend to be accountants.